face, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We're joined by Mark yet again. Mark, how are you? Doing great. Uh, still here. Thanks, Wes. We are going to be talking about a piece of the action. I'd like you to give you a piece, <laughs> piece of the action, Mark, and you can give me back an equally sized chunk of the action, I suppose. I, I have a non sequitur. Would you like me to wait till after the clip or give it to you now? Uh, you can do it as the lead-in. How the, about that? The lead-in is that uh, if you Google a piece of the action, you will in fact find that it is also the name of a crime comedy movie in which a uh, police chief played by James Earl Jones uh, uh, captures two small-time hoods played by Sidney Poitier mm-hmm. and Bill Cosby and forces them to work in a youth center, otherwise they'll be sent to jail. And they start to uh, earn out an honest living until they're brought back for one last job (laughs) so i don't know if that if the job is the piece of the action or if it is bill bill cosby interacting with the youth at the youth center is a piece of the action but uh there there is some action going on in that there's a lot of action going on in piece of the action there's a lot of heaters a lot of references to heaters and a lot of uh nice fitting suits i suppose would be the other thing but yeah it's a comedy episode It is called A Piece of the Action, Episode 17 of Season 2, directed by James Comack. Story credit goes to David P. Harmon, and the teleplay goes to David Harmon and Gene L. Kuhn, aired back on January 12th, 1968. Uh, In this comedic episode, the Enterprise visits a planet with an Earth-like 1920s gangster culture with Runyon-esque dialogue and costumes. I don't know what Runyon-esque means, but it was on the Wikipedia page, so it must be true. It's apparently uh, uh, Rolling 20 slang. Oh, so apparently, it was, I, I, it was one, slang? one author's name was Runyon, and he like wrote books that way. Gotcha. I, I, I followed the followed the Wikipedia link that you just referenced. Guys, we're going to play an audio clip, and me and Mark are going to come back and break down a piece of the action. What's this? Now, that's a weapon. Uh, be careful with that. A heater, huh? Hey, the boss will love that. Now, look, we were asked to come down here by uh, Mr. Oxmix. He said... I know what he said, bud. He said some of the boys would meet you. Okay, we're meeting you. Well, those firearms are not necessary. You trying to make trouble? Who? Me? Don't give me those baby blue eyes. What? I don't go for that innocent routine. Sir, does everyone here carry firearms i never heard such stupid questions in my life well since this oxmas asked us down here don't you think we should see him all right get moving down the street all right here we are piece of the action runyon ask dialogue I, I want dialogue. all of the action by the way not just a piece of it piece. is that is that possible a, you can only get a piece unless you're packing a heater that's powerful <laughs> enough to it sounds like we're making fun of the episode but i actually really like piece of the action um you had hinted you didn't like it so maybe it'll be a part of uh, a piece of disagreement between us about how much action there is in this episode you, you know what this uh, episode reminded me of did you ever watch the old like gilligan's island reruns yep. uh when you when you were growing up so they would always like all of a sudden have this weird not flashback but reimagining and the characters would be in like victorian england or they'd be in a completely different setting i I don't know if there's a literary term for when you take characters and you put them into an unfamiliar setting just Mm -hmm. just for fun yeah uh but but that's what it sort of reminded me of probably because of the 60s aesthetic to it it was just like well, uh, let's let's put the guys in the roaring twenties and give everyone a Tommy gun. Literally, everyone a Tommy gun, as many Tommy guns as possible. You know what? The episode Mac, the, might actually the worst thing it does for me is that it shows me that the Royale on TNG was not such an original idea. So, if anyone keeping track at home, that was probably about six minutes in until Wes mentioned the Royale, which I knew was coming up. The, the Royale, I think, does this storyline a little bit better than what this one does but it's kind of the same idea right it's like you you go to a planet where a sort of the the reasons for the differences are different obviously but there's like you're you're in a fantasy world where um it's sort of based on a book that someone has left behind and the culture has built itself around this book in this case 
instead of a terrible like trashy romance novel like it was in the royale they left they left back uh, like a a history book of like the, the, a, roar, a guide to the roaring 20s or something published like that. in 1992 which was a, a <laughs> great year if you remember which would have been about uh, 25 years after this originally aired yeah it would have been the year uh, undiscovered country i think would have been popping up but yeah so they they based the enterprise the story beat is basically the enterprise goes to a planet where and the ship crashed 100 years ago or something and they get called down. They're like, come down and visit us. And they go down. And apparently the ship that got there before the Enterprise had left a book, a uh, guide to the 20s gangster lifestyle. And this alien culture, which Spock calls like supremely adaptive, uh, has molded their society around this book. So they're all gangsters. I would have left a copy of like the Kama Sutra. Or <laughs> <I know. laughs> left, left a completely different book. Why that book? Why? It's, I have it's a no huge idea. book too. It's like the biggest book I've it's ever cause seen. because the writers wanted to like make a gangster episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I guess uh, one, one place that I think is worth delving into, and you had mentioned the Royale. So there are two ways to get into this sort of um, construct, which is to like narratively write it in uh like you found an alien life form that does this sort of thing or uh you use the tng uh approach which is oh they're on the holodeck so do you like it better that they just find an alien planet that for some reason resembles earth's history or do you like it better that the characters are going to like a holodeck and recreating it for their own pleasures and fantasies it's it's better not on the holodeck Right, like it's better that the planet is its own kind of thing. It, this is what would become a holodeck episode, right? Like this idea would just turn yeah. into the holodeck, and it seems. I, to I make- was I was thinking if they had done it on TNG, it would have been a holodeck episode. But then I'm like, no, they actually did Royale, which was essentially a, on the a similar construct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in TNG, as as uh, this episode was, I think it's always better to go to a planet that does it because it makes the stakes real, and they they kind of elevate the stakes a little bit by when they first beam down, the guy just gets like lit up in a drive by, so. They is it, there is like a sense of people are dying. Is that like the only time they fire the Tommy guns, despite the fact that in the, every everyone. scene they have Tommy guns? <laughs> I think so. I mean, w- would you agree that this episode is depends kind of on if you think it's funny or not, right? Yeah, and I, I may, maybe that's where we differed. I just i i didn't uh, i didn't really i wasn't on board for what they were going for. It was it was just very convoluted. It was like all right. They went down, they talk to a mob boss, mob boss wants their heaters, keeps them prisoner. Then they break loose. The other mob boss uh, takes them prisoner, they want their heaters, yeah. and then they play two mob bosses against each other, 45 minutes pass, and then it's the end of the episode. Well, Shatner, gets, they get the chance to dress up like them is the third beat in that trifecta. Yeah, yeah, and, and Shatner just becomes a mobster, and uh, that's probably the best part of the show is when he's just chewing scenery rid- uh, ridiculously. I was thinking while I was watching it, this, I've been watching all the episodes. If people are uh, done listening to the podcast, you can go to the PenskePodcast.com and you can go to the TOS write-ups where i'm doing like short little write-ups about every episode because i'm watching all the episodes but we're not podcasting about them and i do little write-ups about it i think the the difference um might be this would be i think this one might be less well received if you haven't watched all of the previous episodes to me this episode feels like a real cleanse and like really something different that they're doing and I think that it's lighthearted enough and sort of unique enough that I I really enjoyed it. Um, having to not watch an, yet another TOS episode in the sense that I've been watching so many of them in a row. This one really stuck out as like something fresh and something different to me. I agree that I think the plot is terrible in this one. Uh, it really hinges a lot on the TOS idea that they can't beam people up unless they have their communicators on them. Like because they don't just rescue Kirk in this right they can't just yeah. beam him back to the, the ship so it, a lot of it string it like clings to that idea which doesn't make a lot of sense because at the end of the episode they beam up people when kirk just tells them about it right he's like this guy 12 feet in front of me don't beam him up and they they beam him up obviously beam beam him up onto the uh onto the bridge right you can like talk to everyone for, for a minute yeah so i think that the the plot kind of is silly and they say heaters a million times and like the it's really just going back and forth uh maybe one of the good scenes is the fizz what is it fizz fizz bang the the, the fizz bang is clearly fizz the bang. highlight of the entire episode <laughs> i feel like i didn't even realize that was a star trek invention because I, I feel like i know the term fizz bang is 
like a sort of nonsensical game. Maybe they say it in TNG or something like that at some point. Uh, I, I actually did look at the Wikipedia. I think it comes back in like either... I want to say it's Deep Space Nine. Quark mentions it with like Odo out of context or something that he, he played a game of it. Yep. Uh, but I don't think it's a major plot point. And again, I'm not a Star Trek expert, just uh, what the Wikipedia article said about it. Uh, but I, that was that was the highlight for me when uh, Kirk's just completely... He's like, well, on uh, Tuesday... Uh, you know, deuces are wild, but on right. on Thursday, you need to sunset. flip a card upside down and light it on fire. <laughs> and then there's one point where he literally changes the rules mid-game, which, which I thought was a nice touch. He's like, if you get two jacks, that's good. If you get three jacks, that's bad. The guy oh. draws a jack, and he's like, he's like, oh, no, that's good. <laughs> Wait, that is good. Did I say that was bad? Three jacks are great. It was, uh... I, being as someone who's like into modern board games, I actually felt like the rules weren't all that complicated. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, it's a pretty simple game. I understand this game. I got this completely. This is, uh, I can easily understand what's going on. Yeah, I think that the, I think that they, I don't know. I, I, I like the sort of breakdown of what they do. I, I don't think Shatner's particularly good at doing the 20s actor, which I think is kind of a problem towards the end of it. Um, he looks like he's having a good time. He looks though. like he's having a very good time. I will yeah. say, I will say that uh, he he's there. I think another kind of weakness is that Spock and McCoy don't really have a lot going on here. They're just kind of in the episode. And and we've discussed that. I don't know that my mind is built for these old school TOS TOS episodes, but sometimes I feel like I just miss things. Like I'll be watching it, then I'll be like, "What? How? How the hell did that happen?" And all of a sudden, McCoy is with them, and then McCoy just wasn't with them for, like, half the episode. Yeah. And I'm like, did he go somewhere? Did I miss, like, a, a three-second line of throwaway dialogue where he's like, you know, I'm I'm going back to the uh, to the, to the the infirmary here to check on some people. Yeah. But, like, why wasn't McCoy running around with them in their, in their rolling 20s garb, you know, with the Tommy gun? Well, I mean, he... Yeah, I guess they only had the two. They could have taken the mob bosses ones, right? But he's yeah, he's just he's hanging out with the Tommy gun guarding the other people, I suppose, back there. And I a similar beat is when Spock and McCoy go back to the ship for a bit and then they yeah. beam back down only to be captured again. That was my favorite part. He's like, you know, uh McCoy's like, you know, they probably <laughs> they probably played a joke on us and Spock's like, Well, logically I agree, but we have no choice. And then they beam down and they immediately get captured. Yeah, it was... It's like, why didn't you send down 800 red shirts with a whole bunch of heaters to just storm <laughs> this one city? Also, is this a planet or was it literally like one city? I, or, or is that like a Star Trek issue yeah, that they frequently Trek just problem. say the planet is just the one city where they happen to be? Yeah, the, the planets have like a monoculture. And I think that I think it's the entire planet, but they um, it obviously just looks to be one city. That they so the entire planet is run by two mob bosses who live like a mile away from each other. I guess three. They drop in that third one out of nowhere towards uh, the end. It was right? like Jacko and or yeah, Oxymias or yeah. Ozymandias. What's his name? He had, he had like a, that weird Mr. Oxmix. Superman <laughs> Mr. character. Mr. Mixpix. <laughs> you know, kind of, like you can't pronounce his name. His name was like Oxy, Oximus or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I know. And yeah, the other guy, but... Yeah, it's just kind of. It, it sounds like it's more. I mean, we're obviously making fun of it, but it's it's sort of intentionally supposed to be silly like that, right? Like that's why I don't really hold the Spock and McCoy plot line against them because they just have to go back down there and it, like it's going to be a silly thing like that. And it, I I feel like the episode accomplishes what it's trying to set out to do. Would you agree with that, or would you disagree? I can agree and say yes. It comes off as you know, kind of a a a lighthearted sort of rave up of the the Roaring Twenties culture and and mobster movies and and still say that it wasn't a particularly entertaining episode. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it was. Uh, I I see where you're coming from. That you know, it probably if you were watching them in all all in order, it would have had a freshness that a lot of other episodes would not have had. Uh, but if you just kind of just pick this one out, uh, if you were just going to kind of like just we're just catching this one episode on TV, 
you'd be like, ah, I don't know if this is what I want to see as my Star Trek experience. R- yes, right. So if you're watching it like as a week to week show, yeah, you think it would be yeah, a little bit. A little I, bit I mean, well, as a week to week, if you were like really paying attention to it, it'd probably be okay. If you were just catching one random episode, um, this this would not be an episode that you would want to show someone to show them what the show was really like. I mean, I guess yes. in, on on the one hand, it is because they go down and they meet an alien culture that you know, has this set in ingrained si- series of beliefs, which is kind of what happens on Star Trek yeah. episodes. <laughs> but on, on the other hand, it's not particularly sci-fi. It's the writers just being like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we just kind of, you it's know, had a story about travel. mobsters? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's more of a time travel, travel than a um, meeting an alien planet type thing, except they can go back to the ship whenever they whenever they want to. But it does seem very fil- familiar to what the, the ground that the Royale would tread. Or yeah. the Royale seems to be an homage to this in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, which which is a little bit disappointing, I suppose. But d- did, did, did you, you know Ro- that when you no. when you watched the Royale originally that there was a a kind of mobster no, TOS I didn't, episode? Didn't know. I did, I think this is maybe maybe if if it's not the first time, it might be the first time I've ever seen this episode because I I didn't remember anything about it. I knew that the story was that they go back and they meet like a planet full of mobsters, but I didn't realize it was really because a previous culture had left them a book and like they they sort of read the book and were like okay we'll model ourselves after this i did like how they the the prime officer just like grabbed the radio he's like yeah you want to come down here kirk yeah we we uh we got some stuff going on down here it'd be really good we'll meet you at the corner of fourth and main it's like (laughs) and they they do a lot of street uh stuff and they also give very precise times that they're beaming down he's like give me three minutes i'll be down in three minutes (laughs) be down in three minutes (laughs) I'll be right next next to that orphan who also has a Tommy gun and coincidentally also wants a piece of the action. (laughs) Was was there a point where there's like a little orphan that's like, I want a piece of the action too? Yeah, he's the the, he's the one that distracts the guys on the door. A lot of uh, a lot of a lot of fight scenes with Kirk's patented. He shakes the fuck out of someone and then just punches them in the face and they go out. That's his uh, his move. But yeah, does that move not really work in real life? I can't just grab someone by the shoulders, shake shake them them aggressively, and and then while they're stunned, just punch them. He also has the uh, the great scene where he escapes from like his jail cell, where he beats up the first guy, calls in the second guy, who he like lassos with the guy's sweater, and he wraps it around his head and then. Punches him in the gut. It's it's like poorly done. It doesn't really work. Look like it's uh like they they got it uh, nailed it on that take. But that's the one that they stuck with. Did, was... did they do a smash cut to that one all of a sudden? I know how an Andorian shows up and they and they fight each other. I, I am gaining a new level of respect for Kirk's fighting ability. He just he does everything. He does parkour. He like strangles guys out with belts or sweaters. <laughs> he he like throws elbows. He 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 like sweeps the leg like the Karate Kid. Yep. You know he's he's really got a, a wide variety of stuff. It's like Krav Maga defense fighter Kirk. He's an excellent, excellent fighter. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I found this. I I enjoyed watching it, even as I realized I was like, this isn't particularly great, but I'm I'm very I'm very much enjoying uh, what this one is bringing to me. Can I ask a, a question? Because to me, this just felt like a fun episode yeah it felt like it lacked a a deeper meaning which i and and again we've only done a handful of tos episodes together but a lot of the ones that i've i've listened to you cover on the podcast seem to have some sort of point yeah uh was there a meaning that i missed in this episode and two is it, it what was more common for the series were they were they frequently trying to like make an an allegory about society or did they have more of these just kind of like well this is a like lost in space we're just going to meet an alien race and kind of see what happens thing this is definitely the exception to it most of them are much more like this is what we're trying to the point we're trying to make and this is like how it relates to real life this is much more of a distraction episode which is maybe why it's probably why I enjoyed it as much as I did. Why did you pick it? Uh, it was recommended. People who say it was like one of the top vote getters. Oh, okay. People like so this episode. There, yeah. there wasn't like a specific reason no. or or historically why this episode transcends. This is just one that people kind of felt. Yeah. The, it was just like a fun romp. Yeah. The audience wanted to hear thoughts on Piece of the Action. It's, it's some people consider it like one of their favorites from the series. I wonder why it would be someone's favorite. I understand why you could kind of enjoy it mildly because it's if you know the entire series already. Yeah, I mean because of all the all the 
uh, scenery that Shatner is chewing, especially when he's, you know, got his, like, his fedora on and he's just going around <laughs> fisticuffing everyone. But uh, I, it doesn't strike me as being, like, one of the, the classics. You know why this episode is great? Because they tied the fact that you can shorten the Federation to the Feds. And I think that is like one of the greatest. That is one of the. Right, the Feds things. are coming down the, on us. The, the They're going to steal all of our heaters. The mobsters are complaining <laughs> about the Feds, and he works for the Federation, which he can abbreviate to the Feds, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> that was like a brilliant stroke of genius. I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I. I guess maybe maybe you're an outlier in. Uh, what people sort of what people expect from it and everything like that and maybe i'm, just, uh, maybe I'm not any. a true fan I, I don't know i don't want to offend the the listening audience no but, but maybe you just haven't maybe you haven't seen enough of tos to maybe understand why people would like it like a lot of tos episodes are fairly kind of middling and like i'd rather have an episode like this that isn't really about anything that try something new and has a little fun with it as opposed to another just to like a three tos episode in a lot of ways like mm-hmm. in some ways the threes of tos are worse than the threes of tng because they're very um formulaic in what they come up with the ones are like terrible and you're like wow i can't believe they tried to do that that's a bad idea for a show where the threes and tos are really the ones that are like wow it is it's hard to stay focused on what's going on here um there's nothing wrong with the episode but it's really just sort of plugging along at its own pace, its own 50 minute 1965 pace. And I mean, I think that's partially my problem. And, I, and we've touched on this before, but I'm kind of looking at this as more of a, uh, a, a child of the, the TNG lens. So I, I may be holding TOS to a higher standard than, than I should, mm. because I mean, I've seen occasional episodes here and there, but the, the one that I watched repeatedly was City on the edge of forever um and obviously watch T and G over and over. So, you know, once you see the heights that something can reach, you know, you're not as forgiving to the lows that that uh it may commonly go to. And I feel like, you know, outside of season one and two of T and G, it was generally a, a decently written show. Mm-hmm. Whereas some of the TOS episodes just they have pacing issues. We were discussing that the extra th- five or six minutes just feel like an eternity to me. Yeah. Like the 50 minute hour versus the 43 minute hour with commercials. It just, it feels like it takes so much longer to me. And because of that, this episode in particular, I just, it's like, I couldn't focus. They were just like, they're going to see one mob boss. Now they're going to see the other mob yeah. boss. Now they got captured. Now they got captured by this guy. It's, it's like the, the writing wasn't tight. It wasn't held to a modern standard that I, I would want it to be held to. Yeah. And you see that and you're like, oh, this concept could have been executed much better. Like like the idea was good. The what, execution what, wasn't perfect. So what's a kind of solution to fix this episode? How would you... Well, sh- either shorter or have something else happen. Yeah. Um, the, like I, that was my main problem. It was just like the, the characters weren't distinct enough. We had like two, possibly a third unseen mob boss that were fairly bland. Yeah. And then they just sort of were bouncing back and forth between their offices being captured. Yes. Like it didn't have a fluid plot line that the character's decision didn't feel earned to me. It felt like a vehicle to put Kirk and Spock into twenties gear, have them occasionally punch someone and talk in slang yeah. rather than, a well plotted episode and they could have done it better. They probably could have written it in a really fun way. Yeah. I can't disagree with that. I think that, um, I think I'd be really bored if I watched this one again, kind of like, I, I think that's kind of a difference of it where I needed that sort of freshness off the bat to keep me interested. But I, do I, think- I did fall asleep at the last, in the last five minutes. Oh, did, I, yeah, I must, so- I must argue. I, I did, uh, just go back and, and, uh, and rewatch that because I literally fell asleep on my couch last night. Just but, I mean, trying to I make do, it through this one. I do think it's a shame. Like the characters, as you said, the mob families are basically look the same. They both want the heaters that they have. There's no distinction between them. Um, I mean, so I guess we should break down. Maybe we'll do like a little bit of a philosophical discussion. At the end, they say that they are going to actually go back and take the cut that this uh, alien race is going to give them, the 40% cut, and they're going to put it into a sundry fund, basically, and uh, use it to re-guide their civilization to a more ethical way of being. Is that is that the best outcome? 
for this society. So are they society? shitting on the Prime Directive well, in this one? It, what, they did they the mention Prime, the Prime Directive? In yeah, they sets? said it doesn't matter because the first ship had already made contact with and it. And has the when did the Prime Directive get introduced? Was it like season, season one? one? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, they're like, well, before the Prime Directive, someone screwed up. And right. they left this mobster book there. Do you think that at that point, what's worse? Trying to go back and fix it? Or just adhering to the Prime Directive now and say, well, we screwed up. Let's let their society evolve however it will now that we've already interfered. What's worse? I think that they, I think that the Federation's obligation is to go back and try to make it so that they're not constantly killing each so other. Take which, the book away. <laughs> which, which, which Kirk kind of does. But it also leaves it on that weird All they spot. had to do was steal the book off that guy's bookshelf the entire time and it <laughs> well, would have fixed everything. I mean, it's kind of... Like a, replaced with the joy of cooking and then you'd have a whole like society <laughs> of chefs. <laughs> yeah, just uh, the Kama Sutra, as you said. Yes. It's the... I mean, they ended in kind of a weird spot, too, where McCoy's like, I left my communicator down there. And they're like, oh, my God, they're going to break it open. And in 50 years, they're going to want a piece of our action. And it just cuts to the credits. And it's like, what... What what are they gonna What are they gonna do? What a, what a I'm definitely thing. gonna tell my wife tonight that I want a piece of the action. By the way, <laughs> sorry, put that out there. Give me sorry, that. Sorry, Jess, I love you. Give me that. Uh, give me that heater. Yeah, give me the heater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a piece. Of, uh, I I thought it was. A, I mean, it's supposed to be a funny ending, but it's kind of like a. What the hell does that even mean? Like, well, what? do you think McCoy should have gone back, or they should have gone back and taken away the communicator? Do you yeah. think they've they they just essentially repeated what the what was the it? The Holliston? The Hollister? Is it, yeah, something is it like that, that like bro fashion line from 2002? <laughs> the A and Eagle or whatever. Yeah, the American Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> the Gap. The SS Gap uh, dropped off a book there. No, Fresh, um, fresh Shipment of Pants. Do you think, well, I mean, yeah, I, I would I would, leave, I would go back for the communicator. I think they have to. Them's going, not going back doesn't make a lot. They also just know them. They think that they're gangsters, right? They can just go down and tell them that they're the feds and they're going to take it and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know why they didn't do that. I mm-hmm. think it was just like, well, you know, we got to wash our hands of this one. Wash our hands of the whole. Although the whole affair. point was that the 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 uh, the Holliston uh, screwed up, and then they just essentially repeated the same mistake. Yes. That was made a hundred years before. Yes. By not just allowing them to, you know, kind of do their thing. Yeah. <laughs> Although. The Holston was lost, right? I think they said it cra- like it was reported lost. So yes. I think it. They so it's not the all? Holliston's fault. No, it's but not. They've repe- they've they repeated, repeated the that. same mistake that <laughs> the Holliston, yes. you know, made whether the Holliston intended to do it or not. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah so I mean, I, I I don't know. I feel like again, there wouldn't have been an episode had they just stayed away. But it's almost like they probably should have just stayed away. Yeah. At that, and that's that's kind of my viewpoint. I know you're leaning towards more. They they should go back in and address it. Well, but. I think now at this point, yeah. But initially, it, it almost, I mean, it, it sets it off on a kind of a weird foot. Anyway, where they're like, "Hey, the ship is here," and they're like, "Who's down there on the planet?" The guys, like, "Hey, come on down here." Like, <laughs> like okay. So and like, are the aliens humanoid, or are they like shapeshifters or something like that? I assume that they're humanoid. Uh, I think we've had our fair share of godlike beings. Yeah. So maybe these are not energy blocks <laughs> or, or what, whatever. They they may actually just be humans who just tend to have a predilection towards getting new technology Ad- yeah, and adapting to and things. adapting to it. Um, it doesn't really delve into that. This is another one that uh, you know. All of a sudden, they get that transmission, and Kirk's like. You know what? We could uh, talk to them a little bit more. Maybe study. Oh no, Bone Spock. Let's go down there. Yeah. Just the three of us. He grabs him unarmed. <laughs> well, they, uh... one, one of the critiques that I re- and sorry to interrupt, but one of the critiques I read of the episode is that you never really feel like any of the characters are in danger, despite the fact that they literally have guns pointed at them like every other scene. Yeah, they they sort of it's like played to a slapstick point, whereas. You know those are those are real guns. We do see a drive-by shooting within the first five minutes of the episode. Yep. Shouldn't Kirk be more worried that someone is literally going to unload a gun on his face? And I think the only other violence you see is the end, where the enemy cars pull up and they're like shooting at the building or whatever they're doing, and yeah. then the, the Enterprise shoots some of the phasers. So you don't see a lot of gang violence for as much as like war torn as the city's supposed to be. Although it also has to base itself on 1920s Chicago, right? So it has to be like a functioning city at that point with just some Mm -hmm. gang warfare going on where everyone is involved in the, in the gang, I suppose, because everyone is armed to the teeth. 
Yes. Yep. It's, it's an interesting... They should have, like, uh, you know, warped the Gorn down there and just had him just, just run right. tear through the city, you know, just kind of cross cross things. They were doing fine. Well, guys, uh, I think we've talked about this one. We're going to take a break. I'm going to play an audio clip. And me and Mark are going to come back and give our final thoughts about a piece of the... All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Now the Federation's taking over, whether you like it or not. You people, you've been running this planet like a piecework factory. From now on, it's going to be under one roof. You're going to run it like a like a business, and that means you're going to make a profit. Yeah. Now, what's your percentage? I'm cutting the Federation in for 40%. You got any objections? Yeah. I hear a lot of talk, but all I see here is you and a couple of your boys. I don't see no Federation. Listen, they got a ship. I know I was there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Teppo's got a point. Right. All we ever seen is them. What? A couple of your boys. I'm not going to believe my eyes. Right. right. That's all we ever seen is what I saw. All right, Mark. Final thoughts for a piece of the action. If you guys are on YouTube and you're watching this, you can vote in the upper right-hand corner of the video. Click the little I button, and uh, the poll will come up. You can vote on our 1 to 5 scale. Mark, what are you going to give a piece of the action? What do you think about it? So I'm really tempted to give it a 3 after you told me that all of your fans love it so much, and I, I want to endear myself to your audience. Sure. But, uh, you're going to shit on their dreams? <laughs> I'm going to shit on their dreams? No. Uh, Take a piece of this action. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that'd be hot action, but <laughs> <laughs> steaming hot action. Uh, I for me, it was more of a, a two. Like I, I sort of, I liked, and and a two is harsh. Usually, a two for you is is pretty much almost a one, right? It's uh, two it has is, very little redeeming about it. Two could two could have been saved, but they make a lot of bad choices. That's how I define a two. A two okay, is not like a wow, what the hell is this? Oh, that's that's a that's a perfect explanation because the premise I thought was good. Yeah. I, I do like the idea of when they when they take characters and they narratively toss them into unique situations. And I like the fact that you know, it, it got to play a gangster movie and have uh, Shatner chew some scenery. Yep. But the plot was just kind of all over the place. Uh, it was redundant in a lot of ways. I did mention falling asleep yep. um, during it. It's a and kiss it, of death for uh, an episode. If you fall asleep during it. Yeah. Have you fallen asleep during any of your uh, watchings? Um on, on your uh, commute into work, I've had no. I've had to. I've had to abandon an episode if I feel like I'm not going to make it, which is maybe the same kind of a thing where I'm like, yeah. I'm not particularly inclined to watch it all the way through. But I've done that. But no, I've never, haven't fallen asleep. At, I can't watch. I actually, I've learned I can't watch TOS, be, like after evening hours. Like I can't do it as like a nighttime thing. I have to watch it in the morning. Maybe that's why I always watched it at like 2 a.m. when I came back from the bars because I knew it would just put me right yeah, to just sleep. Knock you out, yeah. Well, it's just it's the pacing. It's just they don't make TV that way anymore. Yep. Yep. So, I think I'm going to give it a 4. I actually really enjoy it. Um so it's a pretty I think this is the biggest schism we've had on any of the TOS episodes with anybody, but I I think that it's maybe not the first one I'd show somebody, but if you'd seen if someone has seen like you know, City on the Edge, Balance of Terror, Doomsday Machine. If they've seen all the big ones, I feel like this is one we'd be like, well, have you seen a piece of the action? That's kind of an enjoyable one to watch. I, th- I think I'd recommend it in that situation. Such a great title, too. It's a, it is a good title. Piece and it actually action. kind of describes what happens in the episode. Yeah, they say they say it like five they times. Say 800. So. They should have just called it We Need the Heaters. We need, they should Yeah, it should just be Heaters. Heaters, heaters the episode. But yeah, I'm going to give it a four. I enjoyed it. But if uh, you guys enjoyed the content today, like I enjoyed the piece of the action, you can go to YouTube. If you're watching it there, you can like in the comments. If you're on iTunes, listening as a podcast somewhere, rate us on the podcast you use to listen to the show. You can go to Facebook.com slash the Penske Podcast. Like us there. Patreon.com slash the Penske Podcast. Go there. $2 a month gets you exclusive podcast content. Me and Clay just did Ex Machina and Suicide Squad in March. New stuff is coming out in April. You can check it out there. Mark, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Wes. Guys, thank you very much for listening to the show. We are uh, continuing our merry way along Season 2. I think we only have one episode left, A Private Little War, and then we're done with Season 2 of TOS. Thank you very much for listening. Let me know in the comments what you guys think, anything, any suggestions you'd like to make, all that stuff. Hopefully you're enjoying our journey through TOS. See you later.